before World War II, I was happy. I was only a kid because uh, going to school and playing with other kids and having fun. We really didn't know what war was until Pearl Harbor struck. And then when Pearl Harbor struck, then we got thought. I said, oh my gosh, our country's going to get hit and this and that. So when we got 17, uh, a friend of mine did her or him and I, we went to Albany to go into the service. And we got our physical, and after our physicals, they'll tell you what the situation was and go find out. I was colorblind and I couldn't get into the Navy. He got into the Navy and I and I felt bad because I couldn't go with him. So I came home and shortly, a couple, three months later, another friend and I, and we drove to New York City. And in New York City on Broadway, we went up on the second floor to uh, sign up for the Merchant Marines. And we signed up for the Merchant Marines and, but before the Merchant Marines got us, the Army got me. So I was 18 years old and I went in the Army. I went in on the April 5th, 1944. Getting, getting into the surface was easy because when we uh, enlisted, we were shipped to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. And from there we went to South Carolina to Camp Croft. We had 16 weeks of basic training in Camp Croft, which was rough. They, they, they really put you through your paces, which I'm glad they did. And from uh, basic training, we went to Wisconsin, Camp McCoy, and we had winter maneuver training up there. And then when we got that done on uh, November, on Thanksgiving Day in November, we got shipped uh, on, the, on the SS Brazil for overseas duties. So we left uh, on Thanksgiving Day. We arrived in uh, Southampton, England, 10 days later. The seas were rough at that time, and we were in a large convoy. No matter where you looked out, all you saw was ships. You didn't see nothing else, just ships. So we landed in, in Southampton, uh, England. We were there a few weeks, and then we got the uh, ship on the LST to La Havre, France. We landed in La Havre, and they had us walk, oh, I would say, close to 10 miles in this slush to an open field. And that's where we set up our pup tent in an open field, cold. It was so cold that, you know, each soldier carries a half a pup tent. And you meet with your soldier, and you set up a pup tent, which is a two-man pump tent. It was so cold. Four of us slept in a two-man pup tent so we wouldn't freeze. That's how cold and it was through the Ardennes. 2300 is 11 o'clock at night. That's when we jumped off the Siegfried line to take these pillboxes that were up on the hill. It took us quite a while to get them, but we finally got them all out. And from then on, we kept pushing forward, forward, forward. And we went from one town to another town. And then, uh, and then when a town was quite a distance away and we didn't have any trucks to bring us, we rode in a, a, a boxcar. The boxcars were called 40 and 8. We lost so many men. I've, uh, I've lost fellas right alongside me, which you can't forget. And then when we, a lot of times when we got to take a town, the artillery would shell the town first so we can get in. And whatever happened, it got mixed up or something, we went in and then all of a sudden we got shelled. And I said, oh my gosh, they're really putting a shell to us. And uh, the shells were loud. You got concussion shells, you got phosphate shells. And it was so loud. And then when they finally stopped, we were already in the town. Then we continued on town to search houses for Germans and all that. And it wasn't until later, go find out, we got shelled by our own artillery. Something went wrong. Either they were late in shelling or we were early in jumping off. And I lost one of my buddies alongside of me and he wasn't hit by any shell. The concussion shell was so loud when they burst that it must have broke everything in his in his head 
because he was bleeding from his mouth, his nose, his ears, his eyes. Because I looked at him, there was no injury, but just blood. You know, lost him there. Well, I was an infantryman. An infantryman is the person that's up in front. Uh, up in front all the time. And uh, and quite a few times, the lieutenant would ask me would have to go through if I would take the lead. And the lead is the first scout. See, your first scout is the point man. And then you have a second scout, which is behind you to your right. And that's how we used to go. And then the troop would be behind you. They're never gathered in one group, kind of scattered. So you don't, they all don't get hit at the same time. And there was one town, Orenhofer, we had a bloody battle there for three days. And, and I just happened to be in the town, just getting a little rest. And all of a sudden we got the alarm, everybody up to the front were being counterattacked again. So Sergeant Neister was alongside of me and he happened to see a BAR. He said, I'm taking the BAR. He put the ammo belt on, he took the BAR, I took my M1 and we started out of the town, going to the front line to help them out. And as we, the shelling was going on, we would hit the ground, then we would get up and keep going. And as we keep going, all of a sudden, Sergeant Dyser said to me, I'm hit. And I looked and he was down. So I laid down and I rolled over to him. And he said, John, keep going, take the BR. I said, no, I'm staying with you till the medics come. He said, no, they need you, John, go. I said, no, I'm not going. I'm staying till the medics come. He looks at me and he said, this is an order. Go. I had to unhook my belt. Leave it there. Took his belt, BAR belt, took the BAR and continued on. And it, later, next day or what, I asked how Sergeant Neister was. He said he didn't make it. I felt so sad. I'm sorry. You can't help it. I'm sorry. Because I taught a lot of them. And, and we lost a lot of fellas. And then we continued on and we got ammo. We were short of ammo and they got us ammo. And we continued on fighting, going through. And then another time, the Germans caught us in a wooded area and they shelled us with mortar shells. Mortar shell, when you hit the ground, it burst. But their mortar shells were timed that they went off about tree height. And when they go off at tree height, the shrapnel really can go all over. And we were shredded up in small balls as we kids from getting hit. And they shelled, they were shelling us, and you can hear the soldiers crying, medics, some help. This, and there's nothing we could do because we didn't want to get hit ourselves. So we had to wait till they got done shelling. When they were done shelling, then we jumped into action and, and helped the wounded soldiers. There was one soldier, when the medics came with the stretcher, the three of us got alongside him and I was in the middle. We put our hands under him to raise him up, to put him on a stretcher. My hand just about went right through him. I said to the fella, he'll never make it, never make it to the ambulance. So we got him there. And then we went to a tent, the other ones that were wounded, they were crying and hollering, and we helped the others. And then I happened to look to see who's next. I said, oh my gosh, there was a soldier there, he was decapitated. So I didn't look no more, I went to another. But we got hit so bad, and I cannot forget this. Every night, 70 some years, I still think of it. We lost a lot of good soldiers. But like I say, we didn't know what we were doing, we were only kids, I was only 19 then. And it was hard. We went through a lot. And our general was General Patton. And you people know what General Patton was. And they had a nickname. A lot of people didn't know what it was. We called him Blood and Guts. It was our blood and his guts. After he was named from us, Blood and Guts. 
He was a good general, but he didn't care who got killed. If you got killed, he put two more behind you. I saw Patton just once in a town, and the town was surrounded with tanks. Nobody can get in that town. It was just covered with tanks. And he had just a little speech, and, and that was it. You know, telling us how good we were and what's going on, this and that. But, but inside of us, we said, there's a whole blood and guts there. <laughs> As he was a rough one. I had a buddy in a third platoon, a very nice looking man, well built, well dressed all the time, mustache, cauliflower ear. He was a boxer. Name was Tony Moreau. He and I, we got along great. Nobody fooled with him because he can really put you down in a hurry if you got smart with him. And he used to call me Dago. You know, back then you can call people names, it wasn't offended. He said, Dago, he says, anybody give you a rough time, you have them, you come and see me and I'll take care of them. I said, okay, Tony. Now here is a man that was a boxer, strong as an ox, on the front line, we were on the front line in this town that we are going to jump in, it was being shelled. And it was just like the 4th of July. And all of a sudden, I can hear this person crying. And I happened to look to my left, and it was Tony Barrow. No helmet on, no rifle, and he had his hands up like this, crying like a baby. And nobody went to him because they knew him. I went right up to him. I said, Tony, you're all right. I took his hand, and he, I can feel him squeezed my hand, he knew who I was by my voice. I took him back to the medics, and I left him with the medic. Now here's a man, as tough as he was, he became shell shock. After I left him at the medic, then I had to work my way back up to the front. And I was going up this incline, and all of a sudden in front of this big boulder, out steps this, show, this German soldier. He had his hands on his head. It's a good thing he did because I pulled up the shoe and as I was pulling up, I looked at him in the eyes. It was only a kid. This kid could not have been more than 15 years old. His overcoat dragged on the f ground that you couldn't even see his shoes. So I took him back to the medics and, and they took over from there and then I worked my way back up to the front. So. I've had some close calls. And then another time, we had to cross an open field. Lieutenant Galenus, our lieutenant, said, John, he said, would you want to take the point? I said, sure. I took the point. Todd was the second man to my right. The point is the first man to scout. So as we were crossing this open field, Everything was going along nice, and I happened to look back, and our troop was just starting to come over. And the minute I turned around, I took about three steps, they opened up on us. Oh, wow, they really opened up. And I hit the ground so hard, my helmet flew off my head, my rifle went off my head, and I laid there motionless. I never moved. And then they started shelling, and they were called the Screaming Mimis. You can hear them screeching through the air. And when they landed, you know, they would explode. And I lay there motionless, never moved. And I can feel, once in a while, somebody has shot at me because I can feel the dirt hit my boot. And I still didn't move. Lay there, and I laid there for the longest time till the shelling was over and it was quiet. I didn't move. I said, I'm gonna to have to stay motionless like this till it gets dark and try to get out of here. So I, I cannot tell you how long it took. And all of a sudden I can hear the ground rumbling a little bit. I said, oh, the Germans are coming after me to check, take my stuff if I had dead or what. And as the ground was vibrating more, it sounded louder and it sounded on the opposite side. And I opened up my eye and it was our tank, one tank coming down. He got so far in front of me, he hollered out, soldier, 
are you all right? I said, yes. I said, get between me and the enemy and I'll jump up on the tank and hang on and take right off. He swung the tank uh, uh, between me and the enemy and I took about three, four hops and I jumped up and I hung on to the gun turret and the way he took off. And when we, we got back up the front, he didn't stop because you don't know if they were going to shell you with the artillery. So they kept right on going because our outfit was already gone from there. And he brought me to the outfit and they said, boy, John, are we glad to see you? I said, no, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> I'm sure glad to see you. So that was my experience uh, being a point man. But I'd done it quite a bit, a few times. And so we stopped there in panic and then the war was over. And then after that, we just sat around, nothing to do. We had to guard bridges, guard roads, protect the town, just in case there was some straggler soldiers come by. And then in August, they took us and they shipped us back to the States to go fight Japan for retraining. So we ended back in uh, La Havre, France, in the place, Camp, Camp Chesterfield. See, some of these camps are named after cigarettes. You had Camp Chesterfield, you had Camp Camel, you had Camp Lucky Strike, you had Camp Old Gold. So I was in Camp Chesterfield, waiting for orders to be shipped back to the States. And when when the orders came through, we boarded ship and we were on our way back to the States. And this one day, this guns went off on the ship and I said what's going on all the guns went off they said Japan surrendered it was August 14th and we landed in Staten Island 17 three days later so we were glad we knew we weren't going to the Pacific so we ended up they shipped us to uh, Fort Benning Georgia and we stood in Fort Benning Georgia till everything was being processed from being discharged from the service and that's where we got this honorable patch that had to be sewed onto your right chest in the front. And after a while, we were talking about this patch. And one of the fellas, I know, you actually said, so You got the ruptured duck on? I said, No, but we will get the ruptured duck on. You couldn't be discharged unless it was on you. So from then on, we always called it the ruptured duck. And we asked different soldiers, you ever hear the ruptured duck? They said, no. I said, we received the ruptured duck before we got discharged. But it was an honorable patch, which we honored. <laughs>